Today, we'll be speaking to a household name in Nollywood and in the hearts of Nigerians all across the diaspora. An actor, a producer, and a director. He has successful movies under his belt, including A Trip to Jamaica and 10 Days in Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming Robert Peters. Hey, Robert Peters. Hey, <laughs> Welcome to the story of Becoming. How are you? I'm great, great. We're uh, so honored to have you on. It's been a hectic day today where okay. I'm making a new film with AY in Miami. And, uh, Amazing. Yeah, and it's titled Father Christmas. It's it's a beautiful concept. It's uh, it's this concept that this is this this Bologna brought in six different family families from every con continent in the world. So to live in one room, one house, one big mansion. So it's just that beautiful story that plays on culture clash, getting to understand each other more getting to understand that there are more things that connect us than divides us and getting to make us understand that nothing is to be feared but to be understood. So we, we've we been working working on the script for a while now, so I'm so excited. I have two films I have to do between now and end of July and I love, love, and, I love and I'm excited about the two films. And I really like the one I just finished shooting in, in Dallas. So that might just be it for the year. So it's just going to be three three movies for this year. But next year is Listen, definitely going to be one or two. I can definitely see the love, like just through your mm. face. I can see that you love what you do. That's amazing. But is it okay for you to give us spoilers? Isn't this like a no no for the movie industry? You don't give spoilers until the movie is out. If you could, if you consider this spoiler, it's okay. But believe me, <laughs> what I just said. What I just said is just a tip of the iceberg. It's, so there's more to come. There's yeah, a lot to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's me making a film in a way that I've never made it before. And if I always have an opportunity to push off my limits, I'm always very excited. You understand? Mm. And I think this one, I'm going to have the opportunity to push off some limits and make a picture that I've not, the kind of picture I've not made before. So that's my excitement. I look forward. You know, the struggle we have, Robert, is we've watched so many interviews of you, um, but mm. you're not a very out there celebrity, right? You're not a person who talks a lot about your life, your experiences. I mean, I try to search for a lot of interviews about you. And so I think the struggle here will be trying to know the real Robert. I think that's what the audience wants to know. Who is this person behind this, you know, director-esque personality? And so mm. my question to you is, of course, let me give you this context. When we see you, we see the strong, physically strong, successful person. I've said that over the course of the interview. Um, mm -hmm. But behind the scene, when the curtains are down, when the lights are turned off, when there's no one else there, who is Robert Peters? Who's that Robert Peters that we don't even know? The goofiest human being you've ever met. Ask anybody <laughs> I love that. It. I love it. <laughs> Ask anybody that, that, that I've ever been and said with me. I'm goof. I'm very goofy. I love what I do, and I'm very excited. I see it as an opportunity to make every picture. When I'm on set, I'm the happiest man in the world. And when I'm at home, I I spend most of my time with family, uh, trying okay. to make sure, yeah, the home front is is strong and well, and make sure that my boys are are, are, are stable and they have everything that that they need to the best of my ability but uh, every other time goes into making myself better and i spend almost all my money trying to buy equipment so if you come to my house a good uh, what a good bed the, the good part of my money trying to buy film <laughs> equipment so if you come to my house you see film equipment everywhere so i that is my weakness and i've been trying to stop but it does not work and the other day we were doing doing a production asset and I was surprised that what I've been able to amass. But at the end of the day, it just goes to that 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 thing that drives me to want to make quality picture. So I also want to make me I want to have the best camera in the world. I want to have the best light in the world and all that. But I'm just an average family man who is trying to just rise up 
through the food chain. I, I'm not the best dresser. I, I, I'm not the best dresser. My focus is not on what I wear. It's most of the time on, on what I'm able to create. And I watch a lot of film just right here. I, I have a 4k 150 inch 12 seater theater right here. So that's where I spend most of my time. If I'm not with my family, just watching films from all over the world. So that is basically my life. And I don't consider myself a celebrity. Okay. Uh, I don't consider my celebrity. I know some people know who I am and they appreciate my work, but I, I, I truly don't. I just so what see would you myself. consider yourself if you're not a celebrity? What would you consider yourself? I'm just a filmmaker who's just trying to push off all his limits. And I see myself that way and it keeps me grounded. So I am not struggling to impress people. I'm not struggling to be in so many circles. Like here, I, I went for an event the other day and people were surprised. Wow, Robert Peters is here. And sometimes you deceive yourself into thinking that you're truly not important. And I do sometimes. And I noticed that when I came into the event, the event almost came to a stop and everybody were coming to shake me and were happy that I was there. If for two reasons, because of the way I carry myself, one, because they don't see me all the time. I, I'm a family man and I just choose to always be at home. And if I'm not at home, I'm out there trying to make another picture. Yeah. Do you read a lot? I am not, I am one of those people that they describe that if you want to hide anything from a Nigerian, you write it in, you, you write it in a book, you understand? I don't read the, the physical book, but uh, I found myself doing so many audio books of, of recent, okay. doing so many audio books and watching documentaries about everyone, anything. So it keeps me, and I, I noticed that I could stay, sit down, Google for about one hour, just checking stuff. So that is where most of my information's, information come. And I do the news a lot, but in the last one month, for some reason, I've just been shying away from the news because mm, that's- Yeah, it can get very, very yeah, scary perhaps. Yes, there's too much bad news out there, but I used to do do the news a lot. Uh, then there's some books that when people recommend and I feel so strong about, I read them. Uh, yeah, but I am not the one to to read every time. I, you read all the time. I, so yeah, let me see. I read like four books every year. Let's put it that way. Okay. So let's talk about growing up. You were born in Sabongari, Kaduna, right? Did I, Kaduna, I hope I pronounced yeah. it very well. I'm an Igbo girl. S <laughs> Igbo girl raised here, Sabongari. And then you, uh, you grew up in Jos. What yeah. was growing up like? What was your family dynamics like? Do you have siblings? What yeah, was it like living class. with parents growing mm -hmm. up? Big, big house, eight horses. You know that house that is your grown body will be seen. <laughs> Wait, say again. Kids. I didn't catch that. You said eight people in the yeah. house, eight kids. Yeah, eight kids. One, one mother. Uh, uh, average family home. Uh, yeah, growing up, I thought we were very rich. I really thought we were very rich. It's when I grew old. Yeah, it was when I when we grew older that I found that we we're just okay. You understand? <laughs> you know. When you live in an area where you're better than most of the people around you, you think you're rich. So that was what it was. Lived in a good side of town. Uh, spoke Hausa most of the time because that's the first, first language in my house. I still think it Hausa up till tomorrow. That's why I don't speak English that well. Um, I, I, I went to University of Joss. Okay. Studied, uh, studied geology and mining. Uh, Worked with an oil company for a little while. And one day I got tired of working as an exploration geologist and I fired my boss. You fired your boss? Yeah, I told him I was not gonna work with him for him anymore. Oh, you, you fired, like, so you fired yourself, you quit? Yeah, I quit, I fired him. Okay, you quit. Okay, yeah. just to clarify. So, yeah. I mean, how many, you said eight kids, you're the middle yeah. child, is that what you said? No, if I'm, I'm not, I'm number two. You're number two. Mm -hmm. 
So did you have to wear a lot of responsibilities in the house? Not really. Uh, I come from that house where I think I didn't start wearing responsibility until I came to the U.S. That was when. But presently, almost all my family live here. Five of my siblings live in the u.s one leave most of them live abroad so but at the beginning yes you when you're going back you have to carry like three four bags but now <laughs> i just go yeah because everybody's here uh i so how many how many girls how many how many men how many women in the family? three three girls five very tall boys Interesting. Where did you yeah. guys get your height from? Uh, my father. My father is about six, 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 two, six, three. My mother. My mother is five, two, five, three. She's really small. Hmm. So yeah. for some reason, I would have pegged you to be from Delta. I don't know why. I just had that mentality. No, I'm from Edo State, but Edo State, I was okay. yeah, yeah, but I was born and raised in Kaduna. Interesting. Hmm. So you know, you tell a story of how you got into acting, and it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. I've heard you tell that story several times. You walked into a radio station and someone just told you you'd be good as an actor. Tell us that story. Okay, this was the story. <laughs> Let me back up a little bit and add another angle to it. Okay, add more layers to it. Yeah, my mother belonged to this group, this church group. And uh, they gave her money to buy, to buy bag bags of rice for their event. And there was this beautiful girl that just came to town. I'm not going to mention her name. She's listening. She knows herself. And she came to town and for some reason, she just liked me. And we kicked it off. We had a relationship and I used all the money that my mother gave me to go to this place to buy bags of rice for the event to just have a good time with my girlfriend. So I was broke because there was one other job I was doing that was supposed to pay me and unfortunately that money didn't, get, didn't come through. So okay, let me back up now. Radio station, I wanted to do a radio station and they didn't have proper position for me. So the only thing I could do was what they call a continuity announcer. You understand? So I announced who is coming next and because they liked my voice, but they wanted me to grow. You understand? Learn a little bit, speak better English, pronounce some words better and all that. And I started doing that faithfully until some people came to cast for a job and they needed somebody to play character called Inspector DK in a movie called Mama Sunday. And they said I should come try for it. And I did. I went, I read for it. The other production that started that didn't come to complete, that, that didn't start with just rears, rears, and I got tired. And before then, I was doing some drama in church on stage. And when they came, they asked me if I have experience. I said, yeah, if drama on stage in church is considered an ex and uh, some, form of a, some form of experience. And they said, yes. And that was how they, they told me they have a role. They're starting shoot next week. And they asked me, I asked them, how much are they paying? They say 12,000 naira. No, 24,000 Naira. Wow. Uh, and they're going to give me 12,000 Naira upfront. That was plenty of money then. Then they gave me 12,000 Naira and I said, okay, man, I'll keep myself in this way. So the, with that 12,000 <laughs> Naira, I was able to pay my mom back. She never knew what happened. And that was how I started, made my first film. After that film, I just graduated from university. So I had to go for my NYC. And Fortunately, that film was a phenomenal hit. So all through my NYC, all through my travel, because my NYC was in a place called Iseluku in Delta State. And I just noticed that every restaurant I go for, people just look at me and pay for my food. I say, man, this life is good. This is good life. And that's how I started and left. How old were you at the time? How old were you I, at the time? I think I was like 22 or 23. I'll never forget. That's where that was when I started going bald. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, Tupac died in nineteen. When Tupac died, I was a big Tupac fan, so I shaved my. I was shaving my hair. So and I said, okay, Tupac is dead. Is dead and gone. Let me let the hair grow, and the hair in front stop growing. You understand? That's how I noticed I was bald. And it was about <laughs> that time. Yeah, I think it was about that was ninety six. 
Mm. Right. So looking back right now and how you got into acting, it's not conventional. It's not something that happens to everyone. Would yeah. you say it was divine, some kind of divine intervention in you getting into acting and finding this passion? From the very first film I did, I knew I was going to be, I was going to be a filmmaker. I'll never forget. I, the very first day I went to set, I slept that day because it was a new experience for me. I'd been on some stage play. We tried to make a movie. We tried to turn a stage play into, into a movie before all of this. And I put everything, to, I, 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 I put everything together. But, but I think that movie never got edited. It'll probably be the worst thing anybody ever made in the history of film. I was director DP. I will shoot and jump in front of the camera. So this second time was a new experience. And I could know it was my future calling to me. And from then, I knew I was not going to act for too long. I knew my calling was not acting. I knew I was going to make film. I will go to sleep and I will dream about some big sets that, I, that, I, that I'm on. And that was how it all, it all started. So when I had an opportunity to leave Nigeria, I just left and tried to educate myself and reinvent myself. So speaking of that, you left Nigeria in 2005 for the purpose of, as you said, educating yourself. Mm -hmm. You were able to get a certificate in New York, uh, New York University. You went to Atlanta, mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. a lot of training in Atlanta. A lot of what I've noticed, right, and this might be a very um, limited um, point of view, but what I've noticed based on just researching a lot of Nollywood actors and actresses is that once they move to the U.S., it feels like they start to focus more on fulfilling the American dream. Because it can be a hustle, right? You know, working every day that they lose that acting part of them. They stop acting. Did you ever fear moving here that that would happen to you? That would be your plight as well. It was my problem at the beginning. You know, when you're trying to pay bills and trying to make things work. Mm -hmm. I'll tell people the most difficult thing for me was quitting my job to do this full time. It was, mm. you know, you're used to that very comfortable life where you go work and you make some money exactly and you, exactly and you pay bills and life is just good then you're moving from there to an uncertain life where your life is just based on hustle who you can convince to make the next mm -hmm. movie how you can make and it was a little bit difficult but presently i'm blessed uh mm -hmm. i'm at a place where i don't think how my bills are paid i don't think what i drive i don't think of I don't think of those things that people think of. I, 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 my mind is set on bigger things. So I can comfort them. I'm, I'm not super rich, but I'm blessed. I, I'm really blessed. I'm truly, so, truly blessed. And I appreciate God for it. Nice. Amen. <laughs> so walk me through the challenges, right? Like you said, the beginning wasn't so easy. And I'm going yeah. to just say this, and this is not to be insulting at all. So did you ever do something as little as washing dishes? No, that is almost, okay, so what no, did you, the, what was the most, yeah. The, the lowest I went, you know, before I left Nigeria, I adapted in some films, people knew who I was. I, mm. I, I'll be considered a B, a B list Nigerian actor before I left. Mm. So I was quite known. I would say maybe half of Nigeria then, half of the film watching, let me, let, I'm trying to be modest, maybe 70% of the, 60% of the, film watching if not more film watching nigeria knew who i was by mm -hmm. name by first name i was doing some tv shows that were quite popular and 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 i was doing some movies i was super sub i was everybody's friend in the industry then from rmd to Sentobi to everybody and mm -hmm. and so i was in some of those big pictures of that time and the job was I had to go work at the Bell South uh, as in, and you are there trying to put phones together or trying to unbox phone that people return and people are coming to you and it was a bad choice of job. Almost everybody there were Africans and people would come and take picture with me. Thank God there was no Instagram and Facebook. Believe me, it would have been terrible. You understand? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You would have been dragged, as they say, right? Work terminology. You'd have been dragged on social media. How yeah, did this huge superstar start doing such a job here in the U.S.? But I, I, I stayed, I stayed focused. I, I stayed focused. I stayed. Uh, 
I, I, knew, I had a clear cut picture of where I was going to. And that made things a little bit easier for me. You understand? Yeah, I did some other job. There was a time, man, I could do, I was working with a TV station and just the BS, pardon my French, in that TV station was too much. I don't want to go into details, but there was plenty of BS that I was facing. And I left to go work for Pepsi, but I loved the job at Pepsi because it was just me doing my thing myself. I, was, I used to be a truck driver for Pepsi. Wow. Yeah, so plenty of hustle. Plenty so how long was the how long was the hustle period before you gained your your uh, bearing? Yeah, the hustle period was from two thousand and five to two thousand and eleven. Mm. By two thousand and nine, it was beginning to shape up. I made my two thousand and eleven, early two thousand and nine, two thousand and eight. I made my very first feature, which was a disaster. It was a terrible film, but the picture looked good. Everybody thought, okay, this filmmaker has promise. Mm. Yeah, because the picture looked good, but just the, the story structure and the fundamental of the process of filmmaking were just totally thrown out there. And, uh, and up to tomorrow, some people still believe it's a very good film, but as far as I'm concerned, it was rubbish. Yeah. So, I mean, and you can I, speak boldly about it because it's your film, but yeah. um, you were going to say, please go ahead. Yeah, and I've made some other couple of bad films, making making bad decisions during the process. But what shapes you are those mistakes that you make, those bad films that you make. They, they shape in you and they make you begin to stay focused. You begin to understand, like I said earlier on that, it takes more energy to make a bad film than a good one. Why not focus and make a good one? So that's where I'm at presently. Uh, when it's the same amount of effort. Now, uh, when you went through these challenges, right, for close to six years, as you said, when mm -hmm. you're going through these challenges, what is the one thing that kept you going? What did you remind yourself of? Did you remind yourself of perhaps, I have to do this for the people, or I have to just fulfill my dream? What kept you going in those times, in those down times? Both. Well, yeah, yeah, both. I have to fulfill my dream. We have to, I have, the world need to hear, need to hear my stories. They need, they need to, because at about that time I, I had some, there's a story I'm working with now. It's called The Prince of Africa. I, the first man, the first draft was written the week I came to America in 2005. You understand? So presently I'm developing it into a monster and I can't, I can't wait to make that picture because it's such a well-rounded picture with, with so much relevance to where we are as a nation, you understand? I'm begin, beginning to get to that place that I need to begin to speak to power with my work. Yeah. Mm. We live in a country that is the 23rd richest country in the world. I'm talking about my other country, Nigeria now. And yet when you average our wealth, our GDP by our population, we're number 273, you understand? So. We need to begin to speak to power with our work. And that's one other thing that I'm working on in my, my film, The Prince of Africa, is going to speak to power. It's going to, it will probably make you not respect our founding fathers again, because those guys failed us. Mm, yeah, they well did. Said. Yeah, yeah. They, well said. We came into a country that had no blueprint. We, we mm. came into a country that was highly divided and our division was their strength so why should i respect them would you say and i do have some more questions to ask because i really want to go in deeper and deeper but would you say we've done a good job of sharing your heart and who you truly are to the people through this experience i think this is the very first time i'm talking this deep about exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly if you go out there you probably not find anything like this out there uh, yeah. But this is what this is about, though. It's the story yeah, of yeah. your becoming, how you yeah. became this person, this yeah. stages, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. ups, yeah. the downs, yeah. everything. Probably, I, I, I'd rather talk about my work than myself. Uh, I'd rather, I'd, yeah, I'd rather talk about my work than myself. I, I leave me for people that that are close to me. So, I try not to put put my, my, my whole life out there. Yeah. And yeah. we respect that. We respect yeah. that. So, you know, just shifting gears again a little bit, something more softer. 
the two of your most successful movies, um, A Trip to Jamaica, 10 Days in Atlanta. So you did uh, 10 Days in Atlanta with AY and mm -hmm. Noah. And you said even right now, the movie you're working on right now is with AY. What is it like working with them? I feel like from the outside looking in, we all respect Rams Noah, especially, right? Because he's let me tell you guys. Tell, let us, me tell us a secret. Let me tell you guys one secret. I hope the producers don't kill me. I, I hate a trip to Jamaica. I do. You, you did? <laughs> yeah, I do. What? <laughs> You're trying to hide from the producers, but the whole world's going to be watching this. Right. <laughs> Why it did was, you hate it? Why did you hate it? It was, a, it, was, it was a production that had so many things that went wrong. It's not a film. Out of all my films, that's one of the few, especially the one that are out there. There's some that I pray that people never see. Mm. <laughs> but that was a production that so many things went wrong that it showed in, in the... In the, the general, yeah, the general execution of the project, that I am learning from that mistake. You know, you you never fail; you just learn, and and I'm learning from that. Yeah, you only fail when you accept that you're a failure. But if things go wrong, or you make things that don't work, or you fail in marriages. Uh, you fail in marriage, sorry, or you fail in every aspect of life. You have just learned how not to do do that same thing again. If you are true to yourself and you're true to life, uh, there's some people that they're just outrightly stupid. That's there. But if you're if you're true to yourself and you're true to life, you you don't fail. You only learn. And and for those projects, I learn. And. There's somebody that wanted me to come do a master class on our films. I mean, I say I'll probably do better if you guys want me to teach you guys how not to make a film. Because I've made a couple of mistakes. And, and I'd rather share my mistake because my mistake was shaping people, people better than my success. So what's more important to you? Because you said you did not like the trip to Jamaica. Is it more important to you? that people like the work or that you like the work? It's more important to me that uh, people like the job and I feel it. Mm. This is how I function. I'm going to let you know now. I access everything I do and I ask myself, did you put, ev did you put everything you know in this project? And sometimes you find that, that some of your work you're more intelligent than your work. And you look at some aspect of your work and you say, okay, I didn't respect the audience here. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you watch some of your work. I watch some of my, some part of my work. I say, oh, that's an insult of my intelligence. You understand? So I see my job as a filmmaker as a, then as an audience. And I'm a little bit critical and because that's the only way I can grow. Wow. I mean, yeah. this, is, it, this is like, a whole different exposure into you. Like I had no idea you felt this. You're kind of a perfectionist when it that's, comes to your work. That's what right? people say. But nobody, if you if you are a perfectionist, you would die. Just make sure you always do your best. Make sure all your work. When you look at it, you say, "Okay, I try. I did so my very, best." So very, very quickly, what was it like working with Rams and Noah and Ay? Making 30 Days in Atlanta, which was the first film I made with them, where I had Ramsey, uh, RMD, AY, Majid, Desmond Elliott. These guys, apart from AY, these guys are my personal friend. These are my buddy, Ramsey, everybody. So it was like a reunion. It was a very easy film to make. And I was very happy that that was extremely successful. We sold out every cinema in Nigeria for five months. Every cinema in Nigeria for five months. Yeah. Wow. We, it's Ramsey and Desmond and Ewa. Are they all easy to direct? Or they have that ego on set where it's so hard to direct them? At the end of the day, people dress you the way you, people address you the way you dress yourself. Mm. When you come on set and you work with me, you find out, okay, this guy has something in his head. You understand? Yeah, he's making sense. People tend to let you tell them what to do. There's some actors that that I just finished shooting a film with uh, Stella. Stella, in my opinion, is one of the best, best to ever come out of our space. Mm -hmm. and, and having her on set and telling her, okay, you didn't do this right, let's do it this way. 
and will do it. And you guys try to figure it out. It, it, it's trust. When you're working with cast that trust you and you trust them, you have a better product at the end of the end. Yeah, 30 days in Atlanta, all those guys, they trust me and I trust them. And and we were able to communicate vision. And I listened to them and they listened to me. And we never had any schism on set. Everything was smooth on that yeah. project. Because see, and what happened day, behind the scene is reflected what we see in the final product. Yeah, That's yeah, good. yeah. So at the end of the day, but the trip to Jamaica was a little bit dramatic. I don't want to go into detail. It was quite dramatic. But at about one time, I didn't know if I was the director or member of the United Nations. Because there were, yeah, there were just so many things, things going going wrong. But at the end, so I, Robert, did, I, yeah. I I think in some areas we gave a good account of ourselves. Good, 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 good. So you know, we've spent forty five minutes talking about your love for film, your family, your life growing up. So many, so many goodies shared here. I can see you're ready. You're ready to retire for the day. So many things, so many nuggets were passed I've, on. I've been auditioning since morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. what time did you start your day? My day started at like, okay, my day started at 5.30 a.m. today. Wow. And is that typical for every day or it's, it's no, different? No, most, most days. It's usually between 5.30 and 6.30. Uh, okay. Yeah, then sometimes I have that luxury to sleep till 7. And sometimes. I, then I remember some things. Anybody that is close to me will know that my test messages come in the night. Okay. But that's when I can, that's when I remember things. Okay, yeah, yeah, you need to test this person. Then you send the test and you send that test and you find out that you're staying awake for another one hour before you can go back to sleep. But I'm beginning to understand that if I continue to stay awake at night, I'm going to die young. So I am trying to make conscious effort to just do what I need to do and go back to sleep. Because what time does, do you go to bed usually? Uh, you know, I travel a lot. Okay. Yeah, I travel a lot and I travel to different time, diff travel through different time zones. So my sleeping pattern is confused. So I go to sleep when I'm tired. Mm. So of recent, I found out that that had been like 11, 12, 1. Okay. You yeah, understand? Yeah. But it is beginning to shape on back because I didn't travel for a little while, travel through different time zones in a little while. But I'm going to go back to traveling through different mm -hmm. time zones now. But you're just going to find out that I only sleep when I'm tired because my sleep pattern is confused. You're traveling from Atlanta to Nigeria, which is five hours away. Then you travel to Zimbabwe, which is seven to eight hours away. Then you travel to South Africa, which is another seven to eight hours away. Then you come back to Nigeria, go to California, which is three hours on the other side. You understand? So at the end of the day, when you do plenty of this travel, your sleep pattern is just totally confused. It's confused, exactly. Yeah, but so, you're, you're handling everything very well, I mean. So you, you'll find that you sleep when, you, when you're when you tired. Yeah. yeah. You know, so let me ask you this. Like I said, we're going to wrap up. This is my second to the last question. Mm -hmm. What do you want Nollywood to do better and young actors and actresses to do better? Because now there are a lot of new names coming out, coming to the limelight. You have people like, Which... you know, Sharon Aja, especially with this new mode of, of uh, transmitting, you know, media mm -hmm. videos and stuff. So you have YouTube now, you have social media that's on and for lack of a better word, popping. How, what advice would you give this new age uh, Nigerian actors and actresses? I'm just going to give them to, to, to start, keep doing what they're doing. So there's some beautiful people out there. Inedima, okay. Inedima Okoje, uh, Zena Balogo. Those girls are killing yes. it. Yes. You understand? And we have some guys killing it too. Gideon Okeke, Blossom Chukujeku. Then, then the old Blossom, guys. Yes. Yeah. Blossom is very good. RMD. Uh, 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 man, Alessia Kubo is doing his team. Boys yes. are killing it. You understand? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the advice is just, I'm just going to tell them, let's go deeper, man. Because presently one of our big problems is acting. It can be better. We can go deeper. We can be more believable. Uh, we need to begin to understand that what makes us what makes you an actor is not what you say when you're acting, it's what you do 
when you're not saying anything. So getting to understand those those dark spots, feeling those dark spots in acting so that we can begin to have that seamless characterization, seamless interpretation of character so that we can begin to position ourselves to compete in the global marketplace, which is what all of us want to do. Then have representation in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Most of our actors That's don't key. have representation in Hollywood. So when they want to cast Black Panther, they don't know who to go. We are the most yes, popular black true. nation in the world. We and have, we have all these resources in Africa have, right now, all these people. We have the seventh largest population in the world. We are a force. The Nigerians, we are a force. And that's why you see our presence on the on social on the internet space is very, very strong. When you say anything against the Nigeria, the whole army of Nigeria online people will come after you and clamp you down. So we need to begin to take advantage of that. Uh, we, the creative, we're, we're doing that with Netflix presently. Uh, in Africa, I think it's almost 10 to 1. For every 10 Nigerian film, they pick 10 Nigerian content. They pick one from different African content. People say, yeah, it's like that because you guys are cheap. I say, no, if you say that you're cheap, that means you're saying that Netflix is stupid. They just want to know. It's just because of where we have been able to position ourselves in in the general in the pop, market yeah mm -hmm. general uh, pop culture and market yeah robert this has been an absolute pleasure now i know you i feel like i know you you were this figure that i couldn't really you know understand i didn't understand who you are but now i fully know you in and out i really do i really do from talking about your family talking about your career which you love so much talking about growing up I mean, it's been such a great experience. Thank you for sharing your story of becoming with us. I'm going to close now with this quote I saw on The Guardian about you. And, thank and the you, title. And thank you for ask, asking the right questions. Oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. So let me close. And then, of course, you can give final comments once I read this, uh, this quote from The Guardian about you. Mm. It's uh, titled The Rise and Rise of Robert Peter. And it says, nearly everything he has touched as a filmmaker, since he left Nigeria in 2005, has literally turned gold. Films that he has starred in, photographed and or directed have effortlessly made it to the top 10 of the very exclusive list of Nigerian top box office earners. How do you feel about that? It makes you feel good. It makes you feel that you're a front runner. It makes you feel that people are still trying to demystify you. And you know, in Nigeria, okay, what is he doing? Okay, okay, now nah, it's rubbish. It makes you feel that, but it also makes you pat yourself on the back and say, man, you're traveling in the right direction. You did oh, that. Yeah, but there's one thing I need to let you guys know, man, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, okay, and we are ready. We're gonna be tuned <laughs> in, waiting for that which we haven't seen yet. Robert, thank you again. It's been such an absolute pleasure. Thank you and have a great night, okay? We you appreciate too. it. Everyone, thank you so much for watching the story of Becoming. This has been an absolute pleasure getting to learn more about Robert Peters. Our hope and desire is that you can learn from his story of Becoming, learn how to overcome your obstacles, and hopefully one day you'll be on this platform sharing your story of Becoming. Thanks for watching.